I'd like to call to order the City Council regular meeting on Tuesday, October 16th, 2012. Uh, with that, we will uh, go ahead and open up with an invocation uh, from Pastor Myrtleine Hester of Lighthouse. Myrtleine, would you please come up? <coughs> Thank you, Myrtleine. We all bow our heads, please. Father God, we come this evening giving you praise, glory, and honor. We thank you for this occasion. We ask you to be in our midst, and we speak peace and harmony in this meeting tonight. Thank you for traveling grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Merlin. Uh, please follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Myrtleine. And she was from Lighthouse Refuge Christian Center. Appreciate it. Uh, roll call, please. Here. Councilwoman Gussie. Here. Councilmember Kimball. Here. Councilmember Potter. Present. Vice Mayor Farrell. Here. Mayor Price. Here. Mr. Mayor, we have a quorum. Thank you. Moving on to Section 3, Proclamations, Acknowledgements, and Awards. We have a few things this evening. Uh, we're going to start with a uh, proclamation, and uh, I'll go ahead and read it from here. Uh, the proclamation this uh, council meeting is dealing with the Arizona Cities and Towns Week. Uh, whereas the citizens of the city of Maricopa rely on local government to experience a high quality of life in our community, and whereas the local governments around the state of Arizona work 24 hours a day, seven days a week to deliver city services such as fire, police, and emergency medical services to create safe communities, and the methods and fundings these vital ser city services are not always clearly understood by citizens. And whereas it is one of the responsibilities of city and town officials to ensure that legislators, media, and citizens understand their local government through open and frequent communication using various avenues and means, and whereas it is important to work to encourage this connection and inform citizens, state legislators, of the importance of state shared revenues in order to preserve the excellent delivery of services that our citizens have come to expect in our city, and whereas through education and awareness, citizens, community leaders, and city staff can work together to ensure the services provided by the city of Maricopa can remain exceptional elements of the quality of life of our community. And now, therefore, be it resolved, the City of Maricopa joins with the League of Arizona Cities and Towns and fellow municipalities across the state of Arizona in declaring October 22nd through the 26th, 2012, Arizona Cities and Towns Week. So, go ahead and, uh, Paul, if you want to come up here and accept this great little uh, proclamation, that'd be great. Thank you, Paul. Mr. Mayor, thank Appreciate you very much. It. Thank you. All right. With that, I'm going to invite Paul back up, and uh, we have uh, some thank yous to give out this afternoon, or this evening. Go ahead and turn it over to you, Paul. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, tonight we wanted to uh, uh, give out certificates of appreciation to all the members of the boards, committees, and commissions who are not returning uh, in this latest round. So these are people who have served the city uh, over the years, dedicated their time and, and commitment to uh, city services and, and, uh, and shared with us their, their vision of, of what they believe Maricopa should be. Uh, we think it's really important to thank them. And so, Mr. Mayor, we have certificates for you to pass out to the members who will, these are members who will not returning this next uh, round of, of committees. So we're going to start... And do you want me to read them to you, or do you, would you like to read? Uh, I can read them. Okay. So this will be the, and she's here. Perfect. Uh, the first one is for Courtney Tyler. Come on up, Courtney. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Don't go way too far. Right over here. She was our chairman of the PNZ. We really appreciate her service. Okay. Also, Henry Wade. Henry. Thank you, Henry. Appreciate it, sir. He was also our vice chair of the PNZ. I don't think he's here. Uh, we have Homer Kaliba from the Board of Adjustments. I don't know if Homer's here this evening. Uh, we really appreciate his service. And, uh, the Board of Adjustments, not here. Also, Anthony Camusis from the Board of Adjustments. Anthony, are you here this evening? Thank you very much for your service as well. Definitely. Also, Aaron Rausch, who uh, is employed by the MUSD, so we appreciate his help. Uh, he also served on the Board of Adjustments, so thank you. 
Helen Brown. She served as a member of our Parks, Recreation, and Library Advisory Committee. Thank you, Helen. We made you go the long way, huh? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. They are. In Emory Layton. Thank you so much. He was also a member of our PRL committee. And another member of our PRL committee is Joy Ashley Gibbs. I don't see her here today. Three of the transportation, none of them. Okay, uh, we also have uh, three from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Uh, Matt Gleish, I don't see him. Go ahead and give him a round of applause. <laughs> Dan Frank from our Transportation Committee. I don't see Dan here. <laughs> David Landers, I don't see him here either. Definitely here. And uh, I see <laughs> Alma Farrell here tonight. Would you come up, Alma, from our Heritage District Committee? And she was on our Heritage District Committee. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And definitely Gina. And Gina Diabella. Gina, are you here tonight? I are. Uh, Gina runs one of our recycling centers here. It's her recycling center, but we really appreciate all that she does for us and was also on the Heritage District, so thank you very much. And Tariq is here. And Tariq Williams. <laughs> also a member of our Heritage District Committee. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And then Joe wanted to be here. And then Joe Hoover was also the chairman of this committee for a time, and he was not able to attend tonight, but we really appreciate all that he's done for us. Now, if you'd like to join them, and we'd like to ask Absolutely. council to come down and stand behind our uh, recipients. And, and just, just by way of information, uh, these good uh, gentlemen and ladies put in lots of time to serve on our committees, and I, I just, I hope you know how much we appreciate that, because without them, we as a council cannot do our job, so please give them a huge round of applause. Something wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Great. With that, we'll move on from uh, Section 3 to the report from the Mayor. Uh, I just have a temporary appointment to the BFO. Uh, I've asked Councilmember Kimball to serve with uh, Councilmember Potter and I on the Budget, Finance, and Operations uh, Committee for at least a temporary standing, and he's agreed to do so as we have a meeting this Thursday. So we appreciate it. Thank you. That's all I have from the report from the Mayor. Um, uh, let's move on to the report from the City Manager. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. I do have a couple of um, announcements this evening. Perhaps. All right, can you hear me now, as they say? Can you hear me now? There we go. Okay, we are actively seeking naming suggestions for two of our facilities. One is the multi-generational center, and the other is a park in the Heritage District area. So we invite people to please go to our city website and put in some um, ideas and suggestions for names for these two facilities. 
Also, we have on Saturday at the Stagecoach Days, I'm sure you'll hear a little bit more about that in Call to the Public, as Cindy Dunn, I'm sure, will give us uh, an update on that uh, event that's this weekend. But we're also going to have an ADOT Passenger Rail Corridor Study uh, booth out there. So this is an opportunity for the public to speak up and have some input into transportation, specifically passenger rail uh, from Phoenix to Tucson, which might possibly go through Maricopa. So we want to invite people to get involved with that and participate in that booth. You have an option to vote on, a, on the different options that they'll present. So that's it for my report. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, I would absolutely echo that. If you have a chance to pass and look at that rail study, it's very interesting. Uh, I've had the opportunity to read it, and uh, I would definitely encourage you to vote and you at least get your uh, your wishes known because any any uh, travel that we can have, uh, especially by rail coming through Maricopa, would be a huge economic development. So uh, please please help support us in that. Great. Moving on here then to uh, number six, call to the public. Uh, again, at this time, this is uh, the time in which citizens have the opportunity to approach uh, their city council. Uh, we ask that you keep your comments from three to five minutes. Please state your name. And in that time frame, uh, also just be aware that this is the opportunity for you to speak to us. We typically don't uh, respond uh, to your comments at that point because we have to stick pretty close to the agenda. So with that, I'll turn the time over to the public. Thank you so much. Oops. Good evening. Uh, Mayor Price, Vice Mayor Farrell, members of the Maricopa, Maricopa City Council. My name is Joan Garrett, and I am the chairman of the Friends of the Maricopa Public Library. And I'm here tonight for several reasons. First of all, I have two announcements. My first announcement is for everyone, for the general public, for the council, for everyone. Uh, Friends of the Maricopa Public Library, will be having their semi-annual book sale on October 27th at Santa Rosa Elementary School, and we invite each of you to come and participate. We sell books for $8 a bag, and we even give you the bag. So the, the books are many. We have 145 boxes of books, and we're just delighted to, each and, to have each and every one of you there. Our uh, used book sale goes from 8 o'clock in the morning till 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And um, we would be so happy to see the council members, Mayor Price, and all of the public who is here. My second announcement is to also invite each of you to become a friend of the Maricopa Public Library. Uh, we have our meetings the second Monday of each month in the Maricopa Library, and we would be delighted if each one of you would, be, would become a member. Um, our dues are minimal. They are $15 for adults, $10 for seniors, and I always have a hard time with that because I think I am an adult, but because I'm also a senior, I get to pay $10. So family memberships are $25, and again, Council member Leon Potter is our membership chairman. And so if anyone would like to become a member of the Friends of the Library, we would be delighted to have you. Your money goes for many purposes. One of the purposes of our membership money is to give the library some of the things that the city cannot afford to put into their budget. We also buy the prizes for the summer and winter reading programs. And we also provide scholarships. This year we provided two $2,000 scholarships to two seniors at Maricopa High School. So please consider being a friend of the Maricopa Public Library. Finally, <laughs> what I'm really up here for is to um, invite Joe Gunter, Gunter, our library manager, and the friends of the Maricopa Public Library, if you would come up, please. Thank you very much. I'm going to put this down here so I can get it. Okay. We are providing tonight uh, AED, which is an automatic external defibrillator. And you can see one on the back wall here in this meeting room. And it was because of the generosity of one of the council members, Council Member Kimball, and our matching funds that we were able to purchase the AED for the Maricopa Public Library. And we are absolutely delighted that when it, to think that it provides all of our patrons, our staff, and everyone who comes into the Maricopa Library 
with a little bit of a safer community. So here is our AED. We present it to our library manager, Joe Gunter, and we hope that each one of you, when you come to the library, will feel just a trifle bit safer being there. This Thank you very much, and we actually did it under five minutes. <laughs> you had plenty of time. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Friends of the Library, very much for all that you do. We appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Therese, you're up. <laughs> Mayor Price, Vice Mayor Farrell, and members of the council, I'm here tonight just to remind everybody that our Night of Remembrance is December 2nd at 6 p.m. at the Maricopa Wells Middle School. Uh, that's just right past the high school. This is going to be a photographic uh, night of remembering all our loved ones that have passed on, uh, either as a hero, if they were a former police officer, fireman, or a veteran, or any of our loved ones. I will have flyers out and back if anybody's interested just please give me a call I need all your photographs in by October 30th it, or you can call me or go to Maricopa seniors uh, org and just go into our contacts and I'll be glad to to work with you about getting your photographs of your loved ones and thank you thank you very much Jim allow me for a moment here <laughs> Mayor Price, Vice Mayor Farrell, members of the council. I'm Jim Reeves. I've come here tonight as a citizen, not a member of any organization, to first of all commend the council for last month, the last meeting anyway, having Dr. Steve Chestnut, the superintendent of our school district here, to explain about the override and things that are going on. Tonight I come also in support of that as a citizen, both as an economic development, as I see it in the community, as well as just good homeowners uh, taking care of their property values. Dr. Steve Chestnut is a rare and great leader. We're very fortunate and blessed to have him. And I would encourage uh, the council to continue to support that in any way that you can and to encourage our citizens to look on www.maricopacares.org to see what Dr. Chestnut and others have put out there very specifically where the money is going, very limited period of time, very reduced amount to really help in the schools. That's maricopacares.org. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else <coughs> would like to come up to the podium during the call of the public? Seeing no one, we'll go ahead and close that. Thank you very much for participating tonight. Uh, moving on to uh, 7.1 and 7.2 on the minutes. If the council's had a chance to look those over. Can I have an approval of those, a motion? So moved. Have a first, can I have a second? Motion and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. <laughs> Great, tonight in section eight, we have uh, three public hearings. Uh, just by way of information, in the public hearing, as we, we will open and close each one individually, uh, you are allowed to approach the podium and uh, discuss the, basically what you have to say to the council. Uh, we request that you stick only to that topic or item, um, as that is the that is what we're trying to discuss at this moment. So, with that, we'll open 8.1. Mayor and City Council shall hear public comment regarding a proposed text amendment to the City of Maricopa Zoning Ordinance creating a new chapter, Article 36, for wireless communication facilities. The hearing is now open. Seeing no one, I'll go ahead and close the public hearing for 8.1. We'll now move on to 8.2. I'd like to open the public hearing for the Mayor and City Council to hear public comment regarding the proposed adoption of the International Code Council 2012 Building Codes as Chapter 7 of the Maricopa City Code. You may now approach the podium if you have anything to address us for. Seeing no one, I'll close that public hearing. I'd like to open 8.3, the Mayor and City Council share hear public comment regarding a proposed ordinance amending Chapter 12 of the Maricopa City Code to include fee schedules for parking violations and violations of the Traffic Barricade Manual. That is now open. Seeing no one, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing and move on to the consent agenda. Thank you. Section 9, consent agenda. We have removed 9.5. Uh, if the consent is 
amenable to the council. Uh, can I have a motion for approval, please? Second. Moved and second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, may I have a, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> motion passes. Moving on to section 10, the regular agenda. We'll first go back to 9.5, and I believe Micah will be addressing us. The Mayor and City Council shall discuss and possibly take action to extend the shop local program through the remainder of the fiscal year 2012-2013. And uh, Councilwoman Gussie, I'll turn it over to you after Micah presents. Mayor, members of the Council. I'm Micah Miranda, Economic Development Director, and I'm just gonna provide a brief update on the shop local contest to date. Um, really, background behind this was to promote local shopping opportunities. Um, shopping local has a significant economic impact within the community. $73 per every $100 spent gets recycled back into the community as opposed to when residents shop lo uh, external, um, approximately $73 or excuse me, $73 remains, tw and when you shop non-locally, $43 remains. So there's a significant economic impact. And that $73 continues to recycle through the economy. That has a tremendous economic impact. Um, so that's why we promote shopping local. Um, when you take a look at our Delta, our retail sales tax leakage, Based upon our numbers, we estimate there's approximately $80 million leaving the community on an annual basis. Now, if you translate that into um, sales tax revenue to the city, that's approximately $1.6 million in additional revenue the city could receive if residents continued to shop local. So that's what this program's really created to do, is encourage residents to shop local and support Maricopa businesses. And how we do that is through monthly drawings um, for participants. So you submit into the program. Um, we'll have drawings, Mayor Price uh, does the drawings at council meetings, and it's free money. All you have to do is submit receipts back to the Economic Development Division, and voila, you get cash for participating. To date, um, we have 41 businesses participating, and we only had 21 unique shoppers. So I'm glad that this item has been pulled because I would like to encourage everybody to get out, use this program. Um, $16,000 has been submitted in receipts, and to date we're at about $860 um, of city funds expended to winners. Happy to answer any additional questions. Councilman Gussie. Yes, one of the reasons that I pulled it is because I had heard a presentation by the county supervisor where he extended the picture, the bigger picture, the broader picture, if we were to shop local in Pinal County versus Maricopa County. Can you expand a little bit on that? Absolutely. When you take a look at um, sales tax and how it's broken down, Councilwoman Gussie, approximately um, 9.7 cents on every dollar is collected and used for sales tax. At the county level, that's 1.1%. One, one, pen, one point one penny, it's two cents per dollar to the city of Maricopa, and it's 6.6 .6 going to the state. When you continue to shop in the county, those retail sales tax are able to support roads, public services, and amenities that residents desire. So leaving the community for shopping has a tremendous impact on the amount of services that the city and county is able to offer residents. In one of the, the workshops that we went to, the mayor of Casa Grande had talked about the Phoenix Mart. I think you were president, so it was Council Member um, Potter. One of the things that he had talked about is the fact that if we all concentrated, all residents of Pinal County concentrated on spending their dollars in Pinal County, we would be we're doing an injustice by spending our dollars in Maricopa County. And I know that the distance and many of our residents live, I'm sorry, live here, but work in Maricopa County and they spend their dollars there. I just wanted that expansion to be known that if we spent all our dollars in Pinal County, we, we're doing an injustice by spending in Maricopa County. Mayor, Councilwoman Gussie, I would absolutely agree with you. And 
the services and retail amenities do exist in the community. So I really would encourage our residents to either um, get out and explore retailers that they haven't um, taken advantage of in the past uh, in Maricopa or within the county. So going back to your point, shop local, support county and city of Maricopa. Thank you. Great. Any other questions, discussion? Uh, with that, I'd entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Can I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> motion passes. Moving on to 10.1, the Mayor and City Council shall discuss and possibly take action to approve a contract amendment with Hayden Building Corp for design build construction services in an amount not to exceed $1,781,012 for the Regional Park Sports Complex project. Fred. Mayor Price, Council Members. Um, yes, Hayden, Hayden Building Corp is currently under contract for design build services. Um, this, is, this is the same contract that uh, we talked about um, on October 2nd for the fire station project and that you you do a qualifications based selection um, to hire a design builder which ends up being a general contractor where the designer falls underneath the general contractor so the solicitation for this particular item happened several months ago prior to the start of design for this project um, Th this particular um, project is taking a uh, multiple guaranteed maximum price for construction approach, um, this being GMP number one. Um, this particular um, award or contract amendment, if you will, um, is for the uh, mass grading of the site. One of the things that we decided early on for this project because of the massive grading that's going on on the entire 140 acre property, um, was is that the, the park project would be doing the grading and build the pad um, or the building um, doing the building pad prep for the multi-generational facility so this particular um, award is getting out in front of the multi-gen project although um, the multi-gen project is is further along in design and that is so that they can get out in front of them to build the pad for the multi-gen so to, to something to touch on is is the the design is still evolving they're still working on design at the park we still will go through the site plan review process for the park we'll meet with the oversight committee to get into that detailed design of the park and that this particular item is for them to start construction on mass grading of the site Great. Um, there is some good news um, with respect to the uh, the floodplain information um, we we don't have any formal approvals from FEMA, but we did get some positive responses from them of late. And then we also actually today received our flood use permit from the county so that we could start this work. So, so that, that uh, risk, if you will, that we have been taking on this project is it's starting to work itself out. Let's just keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'll answer any questions. Council, any questions? No, with that, I have a motion. So moved. Uh, second. 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 We have a motion and a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. 10.2, the Mayor and City Council shall discuss and possibly take action to approve a change order to Hayden Building Corp for additional pre-construction design services in an amount not to exceed $770,475 to accommodate full build-out of the Regional Park Sports Complex. So all right, we have a motion. Second. <laughs> and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Well, that was simple. Thank you, Brad. Appreciate it. <laughs> Moving on to 10.3. Yeah, that was uh, stuff we'd already done in the past. So, 10.3, uh, this is for discussion only. The Mayor and City Council shall hear a presentation from Gallagher and Kennedy providing their findings on the City of Maricopa Police Department Internal Affairs Files Audit. Chief Stahl. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council. Uh, approximately one year ago, just about one year ago now, uh, I was before you and so was CityGate as far as the audit, the original audit on the Maricopa <coughs> Police Department. And um, part of that audit recommended that there be a separate, deeper audit into the internal affairs cases dated from inception of the police department until October of 2009. And so at, at that time, uh, we sent those things out to bid, and uh, the winner of the bid was Gallagher and Associates, 
and they have taken a deep look into the cases. There, there were some strict uh, regulations on what they were looking into and what they were looking for. And we were real fortunate in the fact that the, the people that did win the bid was, was also one of the writers of the architect of the original policy that he was actually reviewing when, when he reviewed these cases. So we're real lucky in the fact that they didn't have to ask a whole lot of questions. It was pretty well understood what the policy was at the time. I'm going to turn the presentation over to uh, retired Chief Jack Harris, uh, retired from the Phoenix Police Department. He was the person who actually audited all of the 188 cases. Chief Harris. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of the council, thank you very much for allowing me to be here this evening to present for you uh, the results of the review uh, that we were asked to conduct as Chief Stahl just mentioned. Uh, the review itself was limited in scope to the three questions that you see before you. Uh, were the complaints uh, that resulted in the 192, approximately 192 investigations investigated utilize, utilizing generally accepted investigative standards, yes or no. Uh, those would be standards that are acceptable through, throughout police departments throughout the country, as well as here locally. Uh, looking at the investigations, uh, what we're really talking about here was were the complaints actually taken? Uh, were there uh, an investigation conducted? Were there interviews conducted? Were there attachments? Were there reviews of policy? Uh, and were there recommendations coming out of the investigation? Uh, the second question uh, for the review was for each of these individual cases, was the discipline rendered based on the facts of the case? So did the facts within the investigation uh, indicate that there should have been some type of disciplinary action is what that question is referring to. And then the third question was, was the discipline consistent with policy in effect at the time? And the answer on the third question to each of the cases was yes, because the policy for Maricopa Police Department allowed that uh, regardless of what the matrix uh, indicated should be the range of discipline for a particular misconduct, ultimately, the uh, recommendation for discipline could be uh, changed by the police chief. So in other words, in policy, you have a matrix within your policy within the police department that says if you commit this type of misconduct as an employee of the department, the range of discipline would be from X to Z. In other words, it could be from one day to five days off would be the range. However, the police chief has the ability to look at the misconduct, look at the investigation, and then make a decision outside of the recommendation of the matrix. So in all of the cases, the discipline that was rendered did fall within policy because the chief had a very wide-ranging uh, ability to go outside of policy to see if he so choose. Uh, the methodology of the review was to start out by reviewing all of uh, the related uh, MPD policies related to internal investigations, and then the bulk of the review was to sit down and read all 192 uh, closed internal affairs cases uh, dating from approximately November 20th of 2007 through August of 2011, and then review the findings and the conclusions of each of those investigations and find if they fell within those three questions that we started out with. The range of findings in any internal investigation is going to fall within one of these four categories. In other words, at the end of the investigation, the finding of the investigator is going to fall into, was the case unfounded? If the investigator says the facts of the case as he or she found in the investigation uh, were unfounded, then what that means is that the allegation as it was made did not actually occur. It simply didn't happen the way that the complainant said it did. Therefore, the allegation of misconduct was unfounded. 
exonerated uh, means that the misconduct or the conduct occurred as it was alleged. However, the conduct was lawful and proper. So even though the complainant said the officer did this and was unhappy about that, the investigation showed that even though that did happen, but it was still lawful and proper for the officer to do that. So therefore, the officer is exonerated of that particular allegation. Unresolved simply means there wasn't enough evidence one way or another to prove or disprove the case. So it inactivates the investigation that is the end of the investigation unless there is further information that comes forth at a later date then they could reopen the investigation. And sustained, of course, means that the allegation as it was brought forth, uh, the facts of the investigation show that the officer did uh, whatever it was that he or she was accused of. Uh, in the review summary, uh, when I was actually presented the cases, we ended up with approximately 188 cases review from 192. Uh, 165 of those 188 cases uh, had an affirmative answer to all three of the questions. So they were handled uh, following uh, appropriate procedures. Uh, the discipline uh, did uh, was based on facts and the discipline did fall within the purview of the police chief. Uh, 21 of the cases did not meet the acceptable standards for uh, my review and that would be an approximate ra error rate of about 11 percent. However, I will note that in those cases, a lot of those cases uh, that uh, are within the 21 that represent the error rate are cases that were uh, lost, they were misfiled, uh, they were duplicates, uh, they were uh, assigned different numbers at different points in the investigation, and so it, uh, they fell within the error rate uh, because of that. They were simply missing or they were lost or misfiled, uh, not because the investigation itself uh, was uh, improperly handled. Uh, the investigations that uh, fell within the ones that didn't meet standards fell into a couple of different categories, the ones that we already talked about. Uh, the case was simply lost, it was misfiled or it was missing. Uh, complaints were not investigated. There were a few where a complainant had talked to a number of different people within the department, supervisory people, attempting to make a complaint and simply an investigation was never conducted. And reviewing the complaints as they were brought forth, it appeared that there should have been an investigation conducted uh, based on what the complaint was. Uh, the third category was investigations where the complaints were not investigated in a timely manner. Uh, what that means is that a complainant was able to make contact uh, with someone from MPD, file a complaint. Uh, however, the complaint just simply didn't get followed up on. Uh, in one of the cases, several months went by uh, before it was handed off to another investigator and said, uh, uh, investigate this and finalize it and by that time the complainant had left town or moved and was unable to be contacted so the investigation ended up uh, with a finding of unresolved but we don't really know uh, whether it would have been sustained or not because an investigation simply wasn't conducted in a timely manner. And then the last category is just a uh, minor uh, error with some of the cases uh, that I would attribute to uh, the difference in the skill level of some of the people that were doing the investigations. Uh, when your department was started, people were brought in from a lot of different departments. They had a lot of different skill levels and internal affairs investigating is a particular type of skill level that it takes a while to uh, acquire. And so when the investigator would finish an investigation, they might list it as, well, one of them said not sustained. 
well, there is no category for not sustained. So it should have been listed, in my opinion, in review as an unresolved or an unfounded. Uh, there was a mix up with some of them that they were listed as unfounded. In my opinion, they should have been unresolved or they were unresolved and they should have been listed as unfounded. Uh, but those were not serious mistakes. They were mistakes that could be easily uh, fixed through training. Uh, the conclusions uh, out of the review was that the majority of the cases were investigated using acceptable standards. Uh, the discipline that was rendered was warranted based on the facts of the investigation. So the facts as the investigator determined them to be after completing the investigation did warrant some type of discipline and then it was forwarded through the chain of command for discipline. Uh, the discipline wa that was imposed was consistent with MPD policy and was within the purview of the police chief because, as I stated before, by policy, the police chief has the ability to impose discipline anywhere from a coaching or a counseling all the way up through dismissal or demotion. Uh, I did find that there appeared to me to be an over-reliance <coughs> on coaching or counseling as discipline uh, throughout the cases. Uh, some of the cases, I thought it was pretty obvious that it should have been more severe discipline imposed, uh, but repeatedly uh, the uh, investigation was concluded by giving uh, the employee a coaching session or a counseling session. Uh, one of the problems that I uncovered in looking at that is that in the investigations themselves, in the files, there was no indication that although coaching was approved or training was approved or counseling was approved for the misconduct, there wasn't anything indicated in the investigation itself that it was ever imposed, uh, that they ever gave training or counseling or coaching uh, to the employee or what the coaching and counseling uh, was designed to, which behavior it was designed to change or to improve. Uh, so that is something that it's very possible that that is somewhere else in files in the department. It could be in supervisory notes. Uh, it could be in something else regarding the employee, but it wasn't in as part of the investigation, and I think that would be something that uh, would be an improvement would be to have whatever the end disposition was uh, finalized in the packet with the investigation. Uh, the recommendations uh, that I made coming out of the review uh, was the acquisition of a program such as a program called IEPRO. Uh, this is a computer program that allows the department to assign uh, investigation numbers consistently to citizens' complaints or to internally generated investigations and then to be able to track the investigations uh, for, forever. So you could go back five years from now and easily track an investigation. <coughs> Uh, continued training for all of the supervisors uh, in a very large department such as Phoenix, you would have an internal affairs uh, or professional standards bureau that is comprised of 20 or 30 uh, investigators that that's all that they do. Uh, but in smaller departments, that's obviously not uh, feasible. Uh, so uh, you have one or two people that are assigned to do internal investigations, but many of the times the investigation falls to the purview of the immediate supervisor in the chain of command. So continued training for all supervisors in the department in the proper ways to uh, conduct an internal investigation would be very uh, uh, positive uh, change for the department. Uh, greater adherence to the concept of progressive discipline uh, with less reliance on uh, repeatedly giving a coaching or a counseling for serious misconduct. Uh, 
moving up the chain and maybe fine to start with a coaching or a counseling but if they repeat that behavior as opposed to going back and counseling or coaching or training them again and again uh, some of the employees had been coached numerous times about some what I thought was fairly serious misconduct uh, so they should have gone up the uh, discipline uh, progressive discipline chain to time off or to a demotion or maybe even dismissal as opposed to over reliance upon coaching or training uh, development of an early warning system if one is not already in place there's a number of different ways to do that uh, what happens many times in departments is employees transfer around so they transfer from one detail to another so they're no longer working for the same supervisor they're now working for someone else uh, previous misconduct may not be known to the new supervisor if you have an early warning system in place it tracks things like discipline uh, citizens complaints uh, use of force uh, those types of issues so that a new supervisor or a supervisor getting a couple of new employees on their squad would be able to pull up all of that information and see what the history is of this particular employee uh, the last couple things uh, investigations uh, by policy if you have a officer for example or a sergeant that is conducting internal investigations if you have misconduct that involves a lieutenant or a commander or an assistant chief uh, that it should be investigated by somebody of an equal or higher rank uh, that's just a way of avoiding problems for those employees uh, if you're a sergeant and you investigate a uh, lieutenant and then later a couple years later you're no longer working internal affairs you might end up working for the lieutenant that you investigated so most departments and in fact in your policy it states that investigations of equal or higher rank should be conducted by somebody like that so if a lieutenant commits an infraction or there's a, an allegation against a lieutenant it would be investigated by a lieutenant or someone higher in the department uh, record all investigative interviews and preserved as part of the file uh, most uh, recommendations would be that they're uh, recorded as opposed to writing down uh, what the interpretation is of what the witness or the complainant or the officer said that way there's a permanent recording that you can go back to and replay and see if it matches up to what the investigation actually says and with that I'll open it up to any questions that you might have council questions chief Harris I thought it was marvelous marvelous report I read it several times <laughs> Relative to investigations, if a citizen or citizens were to complain against a chief, uh, where would that investigative responsibility lie? Uh, it could lie with the city manager if it is the chief. Uh, if it's an assistant chief, it would, it would fall to the police chief to actually conduct the investigation uh, themselves. Uh, but it could go to a city manager or it could be outsourced to another department and ask somebody from Pinal County uh, Sheriff's Office from another uh, agency that has the ability to uh, do those type of investigations it could even depending on what the misconduct was it could be outsourced if it was criminal it could go to the county attorney's office it go to the attorney uh, state attorney general's office U.S. Attorney, uh, Civil Rights Division of the FBI, uh, those are all resources that are available to a police chief for investigations. But if it doesn't involve criminal, it was just rude conduct, it was something during the daily presidential, it would probably go to the city manager or to an outside agency that has the ability to do that type of an investigation. Thank you. Mayor Price. Yes, Councilman. Uh, chief Harris. Yes. How much? Uh, you mentioned the software I, IA Pro. How much would that cost, or is it based on the size of the department, based on the needs, or can you give a? Uh, estimate? I'm not sure what the current cost is. I would I would guess somewhere probably in the uh, ten twenty thousand dollar range. 
Mayor and Councilmember Potter, uh, we've researched the price. It's right around $16,000 right now, uh, depending upon if you get the early warning systems and some of the other things uh, as part of the package. And, and um, right now, we're evaluating that to put that into the budget next year. Uh, right now, we've put together a, a spreadsheet for ourselves so that we already have a tracking system and an early warning system. Although it be ad hoc, it's working right now until we get those other measures in place. And, and for Chief Stahl, uh, have, do you have experience with this particular program uh, from your other department? Uh, Mayor and, and Council Member Potter, yes, I do. Okay. Thanks. Chief Stahl, I guess my question would be, you know, when we did the original police audit, it showed a variety of areas in which we could prove in. Uh, certainly this is no different. Um, I know that, that you have the stance of being proactive and, and taking those upon you and, and starting to, to rectify those situations. What do you see as, as being able to do with this particular audit, its recommendations, as well as kind of closing loopholes that, that you see that we could do better on uh, moving forward in the department? Thank you for the question, Mayor and, and members of Council. Uh, the audit is refreshing in the fact that each and every one of these recommendations is fixable, it's doable, and it's well within the direction that I want to go. The purpose of discipline is to correct behavior, not to punish behavior, but to employ corrective measures to make the behavior better and to educate the person on how to do things correctly. Um, that's, but, it, but if you don't follow through, you don't have those chances for correcting the behavior or you don't know if the behavior is corrected later on. Uh, we've already uh, redone our policy, our internal affairs policy. As I, as I promised you before, um, I, I know Chief Harris was a fan of the matrix when, when it first came out. Uh, there's pros and cons to matrixes. Uh, I've gotten rid of the matrix. It's still progressive discipline, uh, but it's much more of let's take the totality of the case involved and let's, let's look at aggravating and mitigating circumstances so that we can correct the behavior. Uh, one of the things that I noticed very few of the times did I see training as part of the recommended discipline and in my instructions not only to my professional standards bureau folks but all of my supervisors is if you're going to recommend discipline there shall be a training component attached to it because we need to concentrate on correcting behavior not disciplining behavior very similar to you can't arrest away your problems. You can't discipline away your problems. You have to take the proactive measures to, to correct the problem. The early warning systems, uh, right now I meet weekly. My command staff and I meet weekly with our internal affairs or professional standards uh, sergeant and we go over each and every case that's in the hopper. Those that we have timelines, uh, the policy dictates that investigation shall be done in certain timelines. We have due dates attached to them. We have who they're assigned to. And the professional standards sergeant reports to us on where we are in that process and how soon we need to ramp up a notification to the supervisor on getting this done and, and things like that. So uh, it was very refreshing to look at the fact that the 21 cases that the Chief Harris is speaking about, uh, in, in many of the cases, uh, we looked at three tasing incidents, and each one of them had an IA case number attached to it. None of the three, and I've reviewed the police reports, none of the three needed an IA. Uh, they just, they're regular police reports where an individual was tased and, and the tasing was done appropriately per policy. And I think that was part of the training that the chief refers to in the fact that untrained people think that they need to open up an internal investigation <coughs> when in fact that's only for when you read a report and you perceive that that tasing or that use of force or that behavior was outside of policy. So many cases were, were activated that didn't need to be activated, and that's why there's nothing written on them in many cases. Can I ask one more question along those lines? And, um, you know, Chief Harris said that, you know, that we seemed like in the past we had an over reliance on our um, training, and it seemed like to me, from an outside person, uh, it would sound like if, if this person is redoing the same event, that, you know, we're instead of moving up the progressive scale, we're just constantly saying, oh, you need more training again, you need more training again. But, but nothing's changing, there's no accountability there. Um, how, how are we correcting that moving forward and actually saying, okay, you've done this twice now, 
it's now time to move out of the training phase and into the you know the next disciplinary phase mayor and members of council part of it is putting the tracking system in place so that you can track oh this behavior is the same or similar to uh, the behavior that was done a month ago or two months ago they didn't have a tracking system set up where they could say uh, or, or one that was obvious and, and that people understood that they could follow um, now we have that system, that tracking system set up where um, it comes to, each week comes to our attention that this is the same behavior by the same officer less than two months ago and, and it's on our spreadsheet. IA Pro would obviously let that information also be readily accessible to the supervisor. The, the advantage of having IA Pro is having all of the supervisors have access to, to that information out in the field. Now. Uh, they have to come to us for that spreadsheet. Uh, the, other, the other thing is we, we, the, the, there was a misperception on the matrix where one person may say that um, uh, driving too fast doesn't relate to um, uh, not completing police reports. Well, both of them are uh, non-feasance activities and should have been lumped into the same category of progressive discipline but since they were two different actions both got coachings instead since they're in the same realm of non-feasance you can do progressive discipline that wasn't done and so now we fix that with our new policy council any other questions on the report any other thoughts I guess I would just follow it up with you know, final thing is, is how much time do you think it takes to, to start implementing these things? I know you've already started on a lot of them, but I mean, do you see that we're able to close the gaps and, you know, change some of these quickly, three months, six months, yesterday? Mayor, <laughs> members of council, uh, with, with the exception of purchasing IA Pro and having it be part of our computer system, all of these things are already in place, already, already been done. Training has already been done to all supervisors, all personnel. The new policy is already written and out to all personnel. The spreadsheets are already done. Um, as I said, I promised the city manager one year ago that give me one year and I will have this IA policy fixed, trained, and implemented. And we have just done that. So with the exception of the IA Pro, we've completed our task. Perfect. Very Mr. Good. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, yes. um, if it's the council's desire, we would be happy to bring you a contingency item and move a little faster on the IA Pro that if you don't want us to wait until next year. Because if what I hear from you all is a desire to move this along, we can certainly do that. We would just need to, to go into contingency funds for the capital cost of the software. You know, to be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm in favor of that. I, I think that anything we can do to uh, strengthen internally our, our police department and, and uh, certainly the outside perception and, and bring that in line, I, I think this is a, a worthy cause for contingency. That's my personal opinion. Mayor, we have a question for Chief Harris. The, if there was 11% error rate and given some might be some overlap with, how does that compare to other cities? What, what would be the typical, like with the software? Would, I, I can only rely that. on my own experience mm -hmm. with a uh, department the size of Phoenix because uh, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not aware of any departments that keep a, uh, a statistic mm -hmm. on their own internal affairs investigations. I commend the department in the city uh, for having an audit done like this to look at all of your cases uh, to see uh, and be willing to look at them and see do we have an error problem here and how do we fix that. Uh, most departments, they just look at it, and if there's an issue that comes up, they fix it and they move on. And they don't go back and, and add up all of them. If you went to some place like Phoenix, you're talking thousands of investigations, probably tens of thousands of investigations historically. So there wouldn't be any way for them to go back and come up with that. Uh, my feeling would be if you were down around 3 to 5 percent, that would be great and certainly within acceptable standards for departments. And I would say that I have absolutely no problem that you could get uh, even below that with your error rate here with these investigations because a lot of these were uh, errors related to the reports themselves. They had 
sometimes four reports, four different numbers assigned to one report. So it looked like you had four investigations when in reality you only had one. Uh, IE Pro fixes that for you immediately. So I would say you'd probably be down if the chief implements all the things that he's doing already and you add IA Pro into that, uh, I would say within six months you'll probably be down to a 3% error rate if that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mayor Price, I would support looking at, at a contingency uh, funds. Okay. Uh, obviously this is uh, not on the table, is it? but just to directing staff that if you'd bring that before us, that would be great. Um, any other questions to the chiefs? Well, thank you, Chief Harris thank and Chief you. Stahl. Appreciate it. Uh, Mayor and members of council, I want to thank you for allowing us uh, to take a deep look into our IA policy, make sure that, that we are proceeding in the direction that we want to go, in the, in the direction the citizens of Maricopa deserve to go. Uh, I want to thank Chief Harris. Uh, he was in early lots of mornings asking lots of questions and picking people's brains and things like that. Um, and he's also injured tonight from a bicycle accident, so I want to <laughs> thank him for being here. Thank you, Chief Harris. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Moving on to item 10.4. The Mayor and City Council share a presentation on case TXT 11-01, a proposed text amendment to the City of Maricopa zoning ordinance which would create a new chapter specific to wireless communication facilities, Article 36. This is for discussion only. Correct. Thank you very much. Good evening, Mayor Price, Council Members. Uh, as you mentioned, this item is only for discussion only this evening, um, as well as obviously the presentation. Uh, this item is advertised for action on oc your October 30th uh, meeting agenda uh, for clarification. So I'd just like to say the staff is very happy to announce uh, that from uh, the time when the proposed wireless communication facilities text amendment was initiated by the Planning Commission, um, back in November of uh, 2011 actually, so we're rounding about a year here. Uh, the Planning Commission has received or reviewed this document six times and subsequently on October 8th of this month, earlier this month, uh, almost 11 months after the initiation, the Planning and Zoning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this uh, ordinance and forward this case to you for your consideration. The culmination of this text amendment includes extensive public outreach, including homeowners associations, wireless industry stakeholder groups, uh, the general public, and citizens of Maricopa. In order to accommodate the current communication needs of the residents, uh, of residents and businesses while protecting the public health, safety, and general welfare of the community, the city of Maricopa finds that the proposed wireless communication fa uh, facilities ordinance is necessary very necessary in order to maximize the use of the existing and future telecommunication facilities, uh, to reduce the number of antenna support structures needed to serve the community, and to establish predictable and balanced regulations for the siting and screening of wireless communications equipment while protecting the public against any impacts of the city's aesthetic resources and the public welfare, obviously. Uh, it is also the purpose of this proposed zoning ordinance, which is titled Article 36 of your zoning code, uh, to assure by the regulation of siting wireless communication facilities that the integrity and nature of, uh, resident, um, nature of residential, rural, commercial, and industrial areas are protected from the proliferation of wireless uh, communication facilities while complying with the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996 and other applicable uh, federal and state regulations as well. Uh, that said, we've had a total of nine uh, citizen participation opportunities uh, since last November. Uh, six, uh, and those nine opportunities are highlighted on this process um, timeline that we've established uh, to track the, the process. Um, this evening would count for the uh, sixth in the last three months. Uh, public opportunity. I would say at the last two hearings at the Planning Commission, uh, we received no public discussion. Uh, opposition or, or input, actually. So uh, I think we've been very successful. And again, that's basically averaging about two, two meetings per month. Uh, some highlights of this code, just to be brief. Uh, the code applies to new wireless facilities, changes to existing wireless facilities, uh, as well as temporary antennas 
that occur uh, from time to time for special events and other occasions. Um, it also applies to amateur radio operators or ham radio antennas and other types of private uh, operations. Uh, I think the major tenets of this code and this ordinance and the teeth uh, of the ordinance are in the design standards. And the basis for those design standards are to applying to the four different types of antenna, uh, the antennas that exist um, in the industry. And uh, you see here on this slide, we've uh, ordered those uh, four different types of antennas uh, from, I guess, least desired to more desired. Uh, so new towers, monopoles are, are likely the least uh, desirable in a community typically uh, down to either a building mounted antenna or a stealth antenna is really what, you know, the least obvious and the least uh, imposing uh, to our uh, visual, I guess, resources, as I mentioned previously. Uh, finally, uh, this, I think we received a lot of public input, particularly from the staple, stakeholders group to let's specify some buy right opportunities for um, for wireless uh, communication antennas. Uh, and as well, we still have a large provision in the code for use permits to be reviewed by the council. Uh, we prepared some uh, basic analysis of other communities and where we might fall within that. And really the major, I think, overriding controlling factor of wireless ordinances uh, are the protection of residential properties or separation from residential properties. Uh, and in doing so, we've identified that uh, uh, the proposed ordinance is really on the probably the more restrictive range of all the communities that we took a look at throughout the uh, valley and the state. Um, so we are very conservative with respect to the uh, separation distances from residences. Uh, this slide you'll see the I, the center, uh, I'm sorry, the setback from residential uh, uses section right here. Uh, basically the red was the initial proposed distance separations to the planning commission. After some additional meetings with the planning commission and stakeholders group, it was uh, amended and it's recommended to the council uh, in black there, bold black. So uh, freestanding towers from residential uses would be 400 feet. Uh, minimum distance and then uh, alternative co-locations, 300, very similar to I think the wireless antenna uh, at the kind of park that you reviewed recently, and then building mounted. Obviously, they can go closer to uh, the residences. Uh, again, the Planning Commission unanimously recommends approval of this uh, text amendment as they have reviewed this extensively and, and had some uh, great dialogue through the process, including uh, in the recommendation uh, was the reference to a wireless design standards appendix guide, uh, which is in production and will be available for you at the next meeting. But essentially it's identifying uh, uh, wanted uh, applications and less desirable applications and so forth. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions and please know, yeah, this will be uh, discussed again on October 30th. Uh, I guess my question is, is you know, as I read through this, and there's, a, you know, we talked about future, we talked about conditional use permits, um, and, and by right, but how does this apply to, you know, I, I build a, a tower and put a monopole in there, and I disguise it, um, and I go beyond, you know, the, I think there's an eight foot wall, and I, you know, so like, like, well, some of the Verizon towers that they're building a 12 or 15 foot wall, uh, kind of trying to go above and beyond to shield noise. Um, but how does that work for, you know, coming back in the future? If I spend $2 million putting up this pole in, in the generating system, and in five years, I'm, let's say I'm, I'm five miles out, I think is what it said from a, from a growth perspective, and, and, gr and it grows to it. Do I have to keep moving out five miles past, or can I re-up at that, at that same spot? Because at some point, we're going to have to go around these towers because you know we can't can't be so far out that there's no no zone no cell reception in the middle of town. Right. Uh, great point. Great question, Mayor Price. Um, yes, these can be renewed. Right now, I think the term uh, that we've specified in the ordinance would be they typically be approved for uh, a 10-year period as as been occurring, so it would be allowed to be, uh, you know, reapplied for, obviously, and maintained. Uh, the good news is, that while growth, you know, encroaches on those 
further route locations of wireless antennas, technology is hopefully going to change as well and continue to evolve. So we'll get the opportunity to revisit, well, is this outdated technology and is it time to encourage uh, an, an upgrade to a more desirable uh, type of technology? I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I, I also have a... I also have an additional question as it pertains to um, one of the uh, one of the stakeholders had had issued comment based on the fact that, in his opinion, he thought that it made more sense to not have a separation between poles. So, you know, again, if you were going to disguise uh, a, a pole as a palm tree and it was going to be 170 feet tall or whatever, and then instead of having to separate it 300 feet out and have another pole that's disguised as a palm tree and have 15 palm trees in between the two, you just put them right next to each other. That seemed to make sense to me, grouping them and clumping them. Then you could have the, the palm trees around it in a little cluster. How, how does that, what was, what was the thought process in separating them versus you know, putting them together and limiting the obstruction of, of the view, so to speak? Okay, uh, Mayor Price, council members, the only two items that we have are two types of antennas that are separated to have a minimum distance separation from one another, uh, which is 600 feet for both, is co-location and the freestanding antennas. So for instance, at Pacana Park, we've got uh, an antenna potentially uh, if it is uh, built. Um, we don't want the, tent, the pole right next to it to have an antenna as well and then the one right next to it. So the idea there is to really limit the number that you have in an area so you don't end up with, as one of the stakeholders mentioned, an antenna farm. Uh, as you mentioned, if it's all wireless or it's all uh, uh, stealth, then what is the problem? Fortunately, within, obviously we don't have a distance separation for stealth because ideally you don't know where they're at. Same with building mounted. The goal of this code is to integrate that design or the antenna into the facade so it's unnoticeable to the public. Um, so for that reason, uh, and keep in mind you can always reduce that amount. Some communities were a thousand or a quarter mile uh, from one another. There definitely was some consistency in that type of policy, which is understandable. You can always go backwards uh, as things progress. As you get more applications, you see them in either demand. Obviously it's difficult to go the other way once, once, <coughs> once they're up. Um, so I, does that answer your question? Yeah. How also does it apply to schools? I mean, uh, did, we, did we define that further as to, as to what the rules and regs the city would like to see from a, you know, towers on schools? I mean, I know we have one or two of them now. How would that play out moving forward? Absolutely, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. There is no separation of a school versus <coughs> any other application, city right away, city property, private property. Uh, you know, the schools do operate under a certain schools, school district right. or community college, for example, operate under uh, state regulation, right. essentially. So uh, as long as they're using facilities strictly for their operation as a school, as an educational institution, uh, which is very common, I think uh, a few of the schools in town have communication towers. And what that does is basically allow them for, for network connection and to, for the schools to communicate with one another. Um, that's, that can go forward. City doesn't even necessarily be involved, need to be involved in the permit tech, uh, legally. Uh, we're not, uh, we'll always do it as a courtesy and review. Uh, obviously they don't need to go before council for their own operations. However, once they bring in or there's interest of a commercial operator to locate on their tower, which we do encourage co-location for that reason. We don't want another structure right. down the street. We'd rather just piggyback on the one that's there. Um, so that would come before you as a use permit, most likely, unless it's in an industrial zone and it meets the buy right requirements Absolutely. that are in this code. Council, any other questions on this? Kazi. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, Member of Council, just want to uh, get back to your first question regarding, you know, you mentioned about if you have uh, this set up and the growth comes in and five. What staff was thinking, and we're looking for your direction, typically right now, <coughs> since the incorporation, Whenever we have a rezoning of land and new subdivisions coming in, we put in some disclosure. For example, we have the railroad tracks, the noise, <laughs> the uh, industrial use, ethanol plant, or if you have any agricultural use and so on and so forth. So we have a list of disclosure that goes in with the stipulation to forewarn future potential home buyers and developers that those impacts are there. So it is staffs. Uh, believe right now that maybe this is uh, wireless tower is here to stay and be here for the future so we might want to put some kind of disclosure if that's the desire of the council we could add that to that list. Gotcha. 
Anything else? Questions? Concerns? With that, uh, I think we'll go ahead and move on then. Thank you very much. I know that Kazi and the team has put in a lot of work on this for about a year now. It's a very sensitive subject, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Moving on to 10.5. The Mayor and City Council shall discuss and possibly take action to reauthorize an annual holiday signage program that assists in promoting local business awareness and economic growth from November 15, 2012 to January 6, 2013. Micah. Mayor, members of Council, I um, have a brief presentation here on an exciting program. It, it dovetails, right? into the shop local program very well so um, what we're going to go over now is the 2012 special event uh, permit intended to support holiday shopping so the purpose of this just like the shop local is to raise awareness of local businesses and increase economic growth here locally um, we want to keep holiday shopping local to boost community jobs wealth city revenue and also to create a more festive holiday atmosphere during the season it's a fun program. We encourage businesses to take advantage of it. So the program is very simple. Just follow the rules. It's, it's, uh, what it will provide is businesses get to display free of charge additional signage during the holiday shopping season, which we're saying is November 15th through January 6th. The program is open to local businesses and industrial and commercial business zones with current business licenses. Obviously, it's not permitted in residential neighborhoods. And eligible businesses need only follow the program criteria and guidelines to participate. The guidelines are very specific, very straightforward, um, easy to understand and take advantage of. So this program has been in effect for the past five years, and businesses have liked it. They've really enjoyed it, and they want to see it continue. So that's why we're here tonight. And it also has helped raise the bar for holiday decorations within Maricopa's commercial districts. Um, it just adds to the holiday season. So last year, um, the Holiday Homes on Parade decorating contest expanded to include businesses. Um, that's led by uh, uh, community services, and they've been kind enough to allow uh, businesses to tag along, and businesses have enjoyed it. So. Um, What's going to happen is, in conjunction with the home uh, holiday parade, is city staff will propose a six-month uh, banner permit fee waiver for the award-winning uh, businesses participating in decoration. And the benefit of that is award, winner, award winners um, get greater exposure and visibility um, with hopefully increased sales and reduced uh, additional signage costs. So with that, I'll take any questions you may have. Uh, Excuse me. Um, is, was there any feedback? You said the businesses um, enjoy it, love it, love the idea of more, more signage and the festivities. I think is a great idea. Any feedback from the public at large, uh, positive or negative, regarding additional so signage during the holidays? Mayor, Councilmember Potter, we haven't received any specific feedback, to my knowledge, from the general public on the business uh, portion, but. The businesses are interested. It has historically grown. Uh, last year, we had about 12 businesses participate in the program. There are six winners. Our goal this year is to have 20 businesses participate and increase exposure and grow the program. Thank you. Any other questions, comments, concerns? No. Uh, if not, uh, take entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Moved and second to approve. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Micah. On to item 10.6, resolution of the Mayor and City Council of the City of Maricopa, Arizona, declaring as a public record a certain document filed with the City Clerk and entitled Chapter 7 Building Regulations of the Maricopa City Code relating to enactment of rules and procedures to regulate construction and maintenance of buildings and structures within the City of Maricopa and amending the City Code by eliminating Article 7.1. Bill. Oh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I was uh, at the last council meeting, I gave a presentation and staff recommends that we uh, go through with this resolution and adopt the ordinance. But I'd like to clarify a question that was asked of me last week by uh, Councilman Gussie. 
I don't think I expanded enough on it. I believe you asked me if once we adopt the new codes, if uh, they would, people would be required to update to the new codes. And I simply said no. And no is the right answer, but that only applies if no work is being done and no change of occupancy is taking place when somebody moves into a new building or a new space. Gotcha. So with the change of occupancy, it, right. you're adhering to the new codes? Yeah, you're adhering to the new codes. Grandfathered in before. Right. Gotcha. Okay, and then I also want to uh, make sure everyone aware is that these codes will not go immediately go into effect or go into effect in a normal 30 days. That. The building codes will all go into effect on January 1st, with the exception of the International Residential Code that will go into effect July 1st, 2013. Okay. And that's not in a, in, in, was in cooperation with the Home Builders Association as to not to deter the, uh, oh, the home building that's taking place now. Okay. Questions, concerns, thoughts? Anything else for Bill on this? We heard a presentation last city council meeting. Anything else? No. Uh, with that, entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Bill. Uh, this next one is the ordinance that just pertained to the last one, 12-09, uh, an ordinance of the Mayor and City Council of the City of Maricopa, Arizona, adopting Chapter 7, Building Regulation, by reference as Section 7-1-1 through 7-1-13 of the Maricopa City Code and repealing Article 7-1 of the Maricopa City Code and providing for severability and the effective date thereof. I apologize. It's an ordinance. I have to read it. So, <laughs> anyways. With, is not public the, or, the only thing that gets published will be the ordinance now and that saves the city a, uh, a significant amount of money so we don't have to publish the whole code but we put everybody on notice on where they can go find the code and it will also be up on the website i know we haven't done one of these in a while so i just wanted to point out why we declare one a public record and then approve it through the ordinance but it's because we have to publish all our ordinances in, in a newspaper and it's uh, the statutes allow us to do it to do it this way to save money Perfect. Okay. Uh, anything else that you have on this bill? Uh, Pretty straightforward. No, Mayor. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, for not anything else, uh, no other discussion questions, then we'll move into a roll call vote, please. Councilmember Brown? Yes. Councilmember Kimball? Yes. Councilwoman Gussie? Yes. Councilmember Potter? Aye. Vice Mayor Farrell? Yes. Mayor Price? Yeah, and actually, uh, Vice Mayor Farrell brought up a very interesting point. I think we need a motion, do we not? Did you not motion? Mm -hmm. We don't need a motion. We can move yes, right to roll call. Need a motion. Yeah. I didn't catch it. Yeah. Good catch. No so we, we, we haven't had a motion. We need a motion on the last one. We need a motion on this one. <laughs> second. So now we have a motion in a second. The last one was. So you want, you want, should we do that roll call again? Just just for good measure? Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Councilmember Kimball? Yes. Councilmember Potter? Aye. Vice Mayor Farrell? Yes. Councilmember Brown? Yes. Councilwoman Gussie? Yes. Mayor Price? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, is that the national code, the Boca Code? No. The, the Boca Code was uh, Eastern Code along with, with before the three model codes that were existing in the country back in the oh, early 90s. Uh, in, that was one of the codes that were adopted, used on the East Coast, and there was a Southern Building Code and the Internet and the Uniform Building Code that was used on the West Coast, and all three of those combined to form the international codes that we're using today. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. You're welcome. Ten, ten point eight. Resolution of the Mayor and City Council, City of Maricopa, adopting the City of Phoenix 2007 Traffic Barricade Manual with the, with the City of Maricopa Amendments in the City of Maricopa, Arizona. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Um, I also gave a presentation on this last council meeting, and staff is recommending the adoption of that document. Council, any questions on that, from that previous presentation? If not, can I have a motion? Second. Moved and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 10.9, resolution of the Mayor and City Council. Adopting the Federal Highway Administration's Manual Uniform Traffic Control Devices for Streets and Highways 2009 edition with the Arizona Supplement for the City of Maricopa. 
uh, a presentation we've given on this at the last council meeting. And once again, staff recommends uh, the adoption of the MUTCD 2009 edition. Any other questions, concerns, comments? Again, we went over this at length. Entertain a motion. So moved. <laughs> Got a motion, a second. <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 10.10 10, resolution. Mayor City Council should declare as a public record that a certain document filed with the city clerk and entitled Chapter 12 Traffic and Parking of the City Co Mar excuse me, Maricopa City Code relating to the enforcement and administration of traffic and parking related laws and regulations within the City of Maricopa and amending the Maricopa City Code by eliminating Articles 1 through 4 in uh, Chapter 12 of the previously adopted City Code and replacing the articles with Section 12-1 <laughs> through 12-62. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of Council. Um, this this uh, amendment of chapter 12 was again not to change any of the actual uh, rules and regulation towards chapter 12 is just to amend and include a fee schedule as described in the actual ordinance as it is absolutely again questions concerns council motion second all in favor say aye aye, aye. motion carries now we do the ordinance on that. An ordinance of the Mayor and City Council of the City of Maricopa is on adopting Chapter 12, Traffic and Parking, by reference as Sections 12-1 through 12-64 of the Maricopa City Code and repealing Articles 1 through 4 of Chapter 12 of the Maricopa City Code and providing for severability and the effective date thereof. Chris, anything else? No. Uh, with that, can I have a motion this time? <laughs> second. <laughs> motion is second. Roll call, please. Councilwoman Gussie? Yes. Yes. Vice Mayor Farrell? Yes. Council Member Potter? Aye. Council Member Kimball? Yes. Mayor Price? Yes. Motion passes. Thank you. And the final item on the agenda, 10-12. The City Council shall discuss and possibly take action on selecting a method by which to fill a vacancy on the City Council, approve an application, and to open up the recruitment from October 17, 2012 to October 31, 2012. Discussion and action. Brenda? Mr. Mayor, um, just to set the tone for you and members of the council, um, with the vacancy on the uh, city council, there are two methodologies for um, filling that according to city code. One is by appointment for the unexpired term, and the other is by appointment until the next regularly scheduled council election if the vacancy occurs more than 30 days before the nomination petition deadline. Uh, it goes on to say the council member appointed shall be a qualified elector in the city and shall meet the qualifications set forth in section 2-51 of the code. Um, and a council member elected pursuant to that paragraph shall be as, uh, elected to serve for the unexpired term. So you have two different methodologies that you can implement for um, filling the vacancy. Qualifications of the candidate for the record code section 2-51 states that all candidates for elected office in the city shall be qualified electors of the city, have resided in the city for at least one year preceding the election in which he is running except that person living in an area that has been recently annexed into the city. Um, so with that I'll turn it over to you. Staff has created a draft application form based on some feedback from council um, that would be used as a template for you to begin your discussion. Okay. Uh, City Council, have you uh, looked over the application form? Obviously, it's not intended to be fully comprehensive. However, it is not quite running a campaign, obviously. So, um, but uh, I think that, you know, from my personal opinion to the discussion here tonight, is I want this to be as open and transparent as possible from a selection process. Now, with that comes a certain amount of time that is required and dedicated by the City Council um, to go through these applications. So really, the way I envision this is something of the such. Um, I would like to see that, obviously, we have this application process. People are to fill it out, to submit all the things in here. We have these essay questions, have a, a resume they attach, uh, as well as letters of recommendation. Uh, I'd like to see them come into to City Hall, uh, to City staff here over the, the course of these two weeks. And then from there, we kind of need to, to kind of negotiate the details here. Um, but what I would like to see is if, if it's under 10 applications, I'd like to see that we interview all 10 of them. Uh, I th would like to see that we make this a public interview process uh, in which we each fire off a question, make it very you know, brief, 20 minutes, something like that, um, especially if there's 10 of us uh, or 10 of them that, that, that want to, to apply. Um, 
And then with that, perhaps go back into deliberations where you would talk about HR details uh, in e-session and then come back out um, and uh, you know, make motions and a vote. So something along those lines, just laying the foundation. We can negotiate, we can talk about it any way we, we see fit. Um, but I, that's kind of my envisionment of, of you know, one of the best practices. Uh, I've looked at other cities. I know that staff has looked at other cities. And I think they're here to, to, to help answer questions along that. You know, some, some other cities in Pinal County do it in, in different ways. Um, some try and interview all the applicants, but again, they didn't ever receive 50. You know, if you receive 50 of those, then we could be here all day. So, I mean, it's, it's just one of those things that we've got to try and figure out how you guys want to do it. So, I'll leave it to you. Well, what happens if you have substantially more than 10, if you had 50? Correct. How do we pare that down and make that distinction? That's an excellent question. It's something we have to consider here tonight. Thoughts? Mr. Mayor, I can tell you how other cities have done that when they've had more candidates. Um, is that what they, when they have more than they can accommodate in a meeting, is they ask each council member to pick their top two, for example, and then that way you know that there's probably going to be some crossover in there, and then you would interview that 10 or 14 or, or 12 in your case if you each pick two and they were um, each individual. So that's how you could pare it down. That sounds good. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. Thoughts? Right. What, what would the timeline be if we have a two-week uh, application process? Just an idea of our next meeting after that wouldn't be till November 20th. So, correct. Uh, going through the interview process, if, assuming that happens, and uh, you know the appointment, what would we be looking at seating? How would that fall into place? Our city code doesn't have a 30-day clause, as I understand it, that says that the city council member has to be, you know, in seat by. 30 days off after the resignation. So we do have some time. However, we have a lot on the table, and we want to get to it as quickly as possible. So um, the real issue becomes, you know, do we try and pen it for an interview process between the, you know, the, the closing of this, which is really the day after the next council meeting on, on Halloween the 31st, um, and into November 1st, some meet sometime bef between uh, the closing of the process and, you know, the next council meeting and have the interview process then. What are your thoughts there? Vice Mayor. What about having the application process continue through the rest of the month, make a deadline at 5 o'clock October 30th? That's our next council meeting, right? And then we can take that next council meeting and decide how we're going to do the process once we know how many applications we have. And then we can do the next process from October 30th to the second meeting November to assign the new council member. So you're saying make it just short of two weeks, roughly. I mean, include tonight, and then close it at 5 p.m. on the night of the, the next council meeting on the 30th. And then from there, we would then start to, to utilize that to pare down if there's 15 people. Right, just, dep just depend on, at that time, what we're going to do dependent on the applicants that we receive. Okay. Thoughts? We can only get five or something like Right, correct. Right. Right. Absolutely. Just all of them right. So that's right, absolutely. Brenda, do you have something to say? Um, we can certainly do that, Mr. Uh, Mayor, members of the council. Would it be your desire that we agendize that as an, the actual interview then, or a possible interview to give you that flexibility? Do you want, would you want, if you had only five, to do the interviews that night, or would you prefer that we agendize that as simply to, like we did tonight to discuss the process? On the 30th. I can write it to well, give you the flexibility. I, I, in my mind, I was thinking agenda sizing it as to discuss the process on October 30th. Right. So, so basically seeing where we're at, did we receive 50 or did we receive five? Right. Okay. Right. I, I, I like that idea, uh, but, I, but I hesitate on, on the side of, of having the interview process here in this meeting. I, I think it needs mm -hmm. to be something sure. separate sure. to where we oh, have absolutely. the time to dedicate oh, to absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, because again, if we, if we have 10 full applicants, you know, maybe we want to take five, six hours and do this. No, I mean, I, I however, we should be very, very careful about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, wow. whatever. Four four and a half, there you go. <laughs> But, but again, I mean, you, what you're doing here is you're, you're literally picking the council member that's going to represent the city of Maricopa, 45,000 people, without an election for the next two years. So, I mean, it, it's something that I think we, we deserve to put the time into and to do it right and to do it uh, the way it should be done. Council member. Um, question for, for Brenda. 
do we have, when do we make the determination on that particular person's term, whether they're going to play out the remainder of the previous council member's term or if they're going to go into the next election? When do we decide that? Is it tonight or is it on, at the next meeting, which will be the 30th? That, that uh, member, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I believe, and legal can jump in here if I'm incorrect, they would serve out the remainder of the term of the council member that vacated the seat. And according to HB 2026, our next election would be November of 14, and I believe that the term would probably begin around the first of the year 2015, uh, January 15. So they would be serving for roughly two years. And just to clarify with Dennis, the person that is appointed will be able to run in the next election, sure. considering that is a question on the application. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it's a lot closer to elections. I know some councils like to put that as a stipulation. Well, tell us you did a lot. Here, I think the person who's here is about a year or so. Uh, that's a pretty long period. We can't control that. The only reason I'm saying that is because there's a common misconception in the, in the public that I, so the rumor got started somewhere to where that particular individual would not be allowed to run. Um, so I think that people has. Hey, he left. You know, he didn't. He, he was appointed, but he, he only had. There was only six months left on the term. He chose not to run in that election, but he ran in the election after that. Right. I, I don't think it's I, th I don't think it's legal to, to actually to limit them. I don't right. think that it's we have the resigned. ability to do that. Resigned. Yeah, resigned. To if, if it was council can. Okay, sure. council could do that. Right. I, I think so. Council can. It's usually put on when it's a real short period of time. Right. Council feels they're going to influence an election. Here, I think you have somebody who Well, I think, I think certainly in the, in the question as it's written here, you know, I mean, it certainly is a yes or no question. Do you intend to run or do you not? But, I mean, again, the council doesn't have the power or authority to, you know, stop anybody from running. But certain councils see that as a benefit. Certain councils see that as a, as a con. And I think that that's the idea behind that question more than anything is to, is to open it up to, to each of you and to, and to say hopefully that will generate more questions for the applicants and what you see as important. Uh, some people, again, won't see that as important and, and you know, say, oh, great, you know, at the end of the day, the voters have to hold them ac accountable to, to you know, what they, what they stipulate and what they say in public. Um, just like they hold us accountable for the same thing. Um, and so, again, that's, that's the, the idea here is to spur additional questions and to, to hopefully get the, the very best candidate possible, I think. So. And it's possible that that successful candidate might change his or her mind. Correct. After January of 2015? 14. Well, yeah. Yeah. November 14th is when they would run. Yeah. So, absolutely. That's right. Mr. And I think Mayor, that's a great I question to further on. Yeah. Vice Mayor and Brenda? Just a quick question for staff. Has there already been phone calls into City Hall on uh, inquiries on this position? It's Vice Mayor, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor Farrell. I've had about three inquiries. About three? Okay. Thank you. Um, to poke fun at myself. I would like to just say, if you recall, when I was looking for a police chief, I started out saying the person who was going to do the interim was not going to be a candidate and so on. And, and it was a good thing I ate those words because we have a fabulous police chief. So just to kind of poke fun at myself and let you learn from the, a small scar that I have on my own uh, career history for that decision, you might want to think about that restriction. And, and obviously this application would then be posted on the city's website, available for at any request. Um, you know, again, trying to make this as, as open as possible. Any uh, other thoughts along that? Do we have to approve the application, or is it, it is it as it stands now, and it's it's going on the website? It could, good you, could you could put more on there. I think if you want to. I mean, it's for negotiation it's here, but you know, the, the idea is not to be so fully comprehensive. I think it, we want to leave that some of those questions to individual council members, but it should give us a basic minimum idea of what we're trying to expect. Well, we only had four candidates run for three positions in the last election. It'll be real interesting to see how many candidates we have for an appointed position. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You'll have much more of this. <laughs> Absolutely. Much more. Any other thoughts or questions? Uh, again, so as I understand it, we are going to approve a motion then so that we are going to open the period till 5 p.m. on the 30th. The day, so that's the next council meeting, 5 p.m. on the 30th. And that's the deadline to submit. And then that will then come to us. We will agendize for the next council meeting on, on that 30th or that same day um, to discuss based on how many 
applications have come in on what the next process and procedure will be moving forward in the next three weeks. Am I correct in that? Right. Is that correctly summarized? Okay. Yes. With Brenda? Any changes to the application as it stands? Okay. That was good. No. With that, then uh, I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> what you said. <laughs> okay, you're not allowed to talk anymore. All right, uh, it's been motioned and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes. Thank you. And with that, I entertain a motion to close. So moved. Second. <laughs> motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you.